Hello you guys, welcome back to the channel and a Falconry episode, not any old Falconry episode, one that I get requested a lot and it's long awaited, Aplomado Falcons. I love this little girl. Three days calling to her lure pad. Today we've gone all out, swung magpie, whole carcass. Came along, clipped it, threw up, wasn't sure, threw the lure out, and she was on it straight away, good foothold. So we're gonna let her actually get a little feed a reasonable bit on this. With magpies. Possibly going to be one of her main quarries. Okay, a video that so many people have wanted me to make, lots of messages, and I think especially here in the UK. Here in the UK, the Aplomado is still a bird that's, it's not really tried and tested by many. It's not well known. It hasn't got the reputation yet. Uh, in America, if you're watching from America, you kind of guys know a bit more about the Aplomado. It's much more widely used in abatement. It's much more widely used as a, a falconry bird. You've got tons of our European starlings, which are quite rare here, are an invasive species to you. Perfect prey maybe for a male aplomado. It's different here in the UK, and I'll tell you why it's different. Oh, by the way, this is my office, but I'm gonna flip you around. I'll tell you why it's different, So I wanna sit down. The reason it's different is because price. In the UK, the aplomado falcon is actually a bird that's been around two and a half thousand pounds for a very long time, that was just the price. So that meant it was a breeder's bird, a breeder's only bird, more or less. It went to other breeders that wanted to breed them because they were worth breeding for lots of money. In the last few years, um, I got mine in 2019, the price has come down to the price that serious falconers can afford them. So we're talking around maybe sort of just under a thousand, maybe to around 1500, depending on where you get them from. Yeah, a bird that's nearer the thousand pound mark. That makes it within the realm of the serious falconer, but too much for the dabbler. It hasn't suffered the same fate as a Harris's hawk, and let's hope no one breeds them to excess so that it never does, so the value never drops down. Because if you're serious and you're on a very tight budget, you might think, oh, Dave, you know, that's a lot of money. 1,500 pounds, 1,000 pounds, it's all right for you to say, well, believe you or not, me or not, you've got way more money than I have, believe me. And listen carefully, when I was earning 95 pounds a week, I built housing and bought a goshawk for 1,200 pounds when I was 21, and I'd got a mortgage, and I'd got a car. 1,200 pounds, more than 12 times my week's wages. So if you really do want something, and you're a serious falconer, that won't put you off. So that's where we are now. We've got a bird that's affordable for most people, but I've had to do a lot of thought into this video because I'm already waffling and you know what I'm like. I've got, I've asked, I've asked someone to put into this video, uh, which has extended it, but you're gonna love, love this guy's interview. And then I thought, well, I can ask other people and I can tell you in depth about my, my time with Aplomado Falcons but I'm gonna do some signposting away from YouTube so this video doesn't become excessively long. But you can find all that information. Listen to, look at this. this um, if you're on the channel regular, it's all off the cuff. No notes are ever made. <laughs> I actually made some notes to try and make it more concise. I'm failing miserably now. Go on the World of Falconry. Go on the, you'll see Silent Design, go on the website, get a back issue of a recent magazine article, World of Falconry, that I wrote an article in recently. And that really gives you, it really gives you a grasp and an insight into me flying these birds. So I'm not gonna reiterate all of that again here. I'm gonna tell you some key points. So World of Falconry magazine, check out my article there. You know, I don't know what it's gonna cost you, a few pounds. You can absorb it and reread it as much as you like. Equally. Bob Dalton, he's written a book about Aplomado falcon flying around the world, but as a UK falconer, he's written a book about them. I was gonna ask Bob to do it, and he would have gladly done a piece for this video, but then I thought, it's gonna, again, it's gonna extend the video, 
a lot of us are going to say many of the same things about apple tomatoes, the things we've all discovered that they're famous for anyway. And he's already written it in a book. So again, spend a few pounds. If you're really interested in apple tomato falcons, get that magazine, buy that book. You can digest it at your at your will and re-digest -re it as well as this video. So later in the video, we're going to make, meet Jose. Uh, he and his wife, Charlotte, uh, uh, right up there as top breeders of apple in the UK. You've got Bob Watkins. You've got Diana, Bob's friend. Um, there's three good breeders, and there are a few others. Let me tell you some things about these beautiful birds. But first, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about flying them as an experienced day bird and a lure bird. After that, we're going to get down to proper falconry. Okay, so just a little bit briefly about flying these birds as a experienced day bird. So we brought a pair of aplomados here. Well, we brought two, a boy and a girl, not exactly a pair, I guess. Uh, brother and sister, I believe. The male's imprinted, uh, never been hooded, uh, never flown to the law. His job was just to, I just trained him up really quickly and basically handed him over to Emily here. And she is one of her sort of team birds here. And she flies him for experience days. All he has to do is fly in big circuits, zipping around, staying really aerial like a falcon does and landing on guest gloves, which he does super easily. He's incredibly sweet, dare I say almost pet-like and brilliant at that job. So that's him in a nutshell. You can fly them for pleasure like that, no problem at all. Uh, the female that I hunted with then became post-hunting Emily's first lure bird and she flies him to the lure as part of our experience days and, and at events and shows and on-site flying displays. Um, fantastic lure birds, beautiful, it's getting noisy around here, beautiful um, for the public. Uh, there's very few birds of prey that are actually colourful. Uh, male American kestrels are colourful, but most of our falconry birds are just stunning. They're not really colourful. Aplomados, one of the reasons they're sought after is just their pure colourful beauty. So here is Maya and here is Emily. Emily, you've had this bird as a display falcon. It's your first lure bird and you fly Manny, our male on experience days. Just very briefly, because I waffled way too much on this video. <laughs> Tell me what you like about Aplomado falcons. You're oh. very lucky to fly them. Well, apart from they're very, very pretty, um, just sort of a given with these guys. Um, I just love their, their agility because they're a smaller falcon. Obviously, they need to be able to twist and turn much easier um, than something bigger like a peregrine. So I do love how acrobatic she can be. It proves a bit of a challenge. She's uh, quite good at sort of outfoxing me, getting um, very sharp turns and trying new tricks with the wind. Uh, but that's one of the best things about them. It really... Um, it's just a different thing from a bigger falcon, I suppose. Um, me and her get on quite well uh, as well. Uh, I don't know if that's just with any bird really, but she's got a lovely little temperament. Um, bit of her own sort of nature tells me what she does and doesn't like, um, but she's a, a great team player and we work well together, I think. Fair play. Falconry with aplomados. What can I tell you about them and keep it and keep it short? So these birds, parrot reared or imprint, you decide. If you're not sure an imprint's out your thing, just get a parrot reared one. Think of them like you would a Harris's hawk. These birds are super sociable. They get incredibly tame. We can say well-manned. You can actually go to as far as say tame. Um, they really bond well with a falconer. They're, 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 they can be flown with multiple people around. They can be flown with dogs. Like, like most falcons, if they're habituated to dogs, they don't care about dogs at all. Not one jot. They might as well think they're 10 foot tall and the dog's a little puppy. They just don't care. Um, so brilliant working with dogs and being around dogs. <sighs> Parrot reared is for you unless you really want an imprint. An imprint, unless you're very highly skilled, will be incredibly noisy for the first year or two. Parrot reared will not be. But like a Harris Hook, it can go that way. Get those birds hunting and hunting as soon as you can and killing and feeding on kills. Um, oh, by the way, something you'll hear a lot about is they don't like hooding. I'm going to tell you that they, they like hooding as much as goshawks and Harris's hawks in so much as the larger falcons you may be used to generally hood perfectly. Uh, big eagles hood perfectly and easily. But Harris hawks and goshawks, for different reasons, tend to be hood shy. Um, I've got a Harris sort that the hood goes on, whether it's upside down or not, very uh, and gracefully. It makes no difference. It works fine. He just would rather see what's going on. Doesn't want to miss anything. 
think of your Aplomado like that. You're going to have to be more skilled and take more time to hood them. Ours hoods perfectly well and she always had done from day dot. If you know how to hood a bird, you won't have a great deal of problem, but it'd be more difficult maybe. And one thing, if the bird is made to the hood well, don't not hood it for a few weeks and think it'll pick up where you left off. That's where you'll really fall foul of the not hooding and it'll become very hood shy. So they do hood. They man down incredibly easily. Um, their feathers are like Harris's hawks. They're not like a, a musket, a sparrowhawk or a goshawk, if you like. They are very forgiving feathers for any falcon. A long tail feathers like a, like a goshawk. Soft and pliable as anything. In fact, I think Maya's got a tip missing off one of hers, but like a Harris's hawk, you've got to be very ham-fisted to break feathers on an Aplomado falcon. They train well. This is what I did with mine. I trained her to a, a lure pad with wings on just to get her fitter. I then did mix that up with long call-offs. I was swinging magpie carcasses, crow carcasses, bird carcasses up to the size of cock pheasants. Obviously, you don't want that lure to land on top of the bird, but I'm talking whole birds that I would literally swing in the air let her catch as she came 200 meters and then feed her up and i was doing that mixed with lure work but here's the difference if you're used to falcons do your lure work get the bird made to the lure use a carcass law if you want for long distance stamina but also here's the difference fly it to the glove they fly to the glove just like an accipiter or a Harris's hawk, fly that bird to the glove they will come to the glove many distances just like you'd expect from a goshawk they're perfectly well flown to the glove. And for most of our hunting, they're flown off the glove. So don't think of them like your typical large falcon. Have a lure as backup, have a lure to fitness, fly them to the glove. Fly them to little betchings on the glove. They'll come miles. <coughs> the Aplomado gives you something different. The off the fist flight of an accipiter, the this is absolutely the utter tame, bomb-proof, well-manness of a good Harris's hawk, if you, if you put the work in. But their stamina and speed is unbelievable. These birds will leave the fist, they will chase partridge and pheasant, and they will chase for hundreds of yards. I, this is the thing that amazed me about May, I feel. Hundreds and hundreds of yards, and if the bird puts in, that thing will come all the way back to the glove or the swung lure, without even landing. If you get them fit, their stamina and their tight turning, they're just stunning. They are not like flying a goshawk. They're not like flying a falcon. They're not like flying a harrisawk. Imagine all of those things rolled together. It's a bird for the goshawk flyer that wants to change. It's a bird for the falcon flyer that wants to change. It's a bird for the harrisawk flyer that wants to change. Their prey drive is insane. Now, they may take you a couple of seasons to really get wedded to prey. Maya was up for it straight away. But certain prey, you might have to put more time in. Game birds for Maya. Partridge, any distance. She would fly them for miles, but they've got to be fit, like any bird, to overhaul the partridge. That's where the key of fitness comes in. They will fly hen pheasants. They will fly cock pheasants. You'll hear this a lot, and you'll be scared out of it. They'll fly them. Maya flew rabbits, never caught one. She flew hares. This is all just because they're like, oh, so it's moving, I'm going to chase it. She never bound to a hare. She would chase hares. As dumb as that sounds, even a six and a half pound young leveret, when you consider the weight of these birds, don't go by my weights, but this is the sort of weights ours flies at. Just over eight ounces for the male, eight and a half ounces flying weight, and about 14 ounces, maybe a little bit more for the female, but really 13 and a half ounces as a hunting weight, like a harrisock. They'll often fly and do stuff at higher weights, but to get them driven to bind and take prey, you might have to have them a little bit keener, have that prey drive, that bloodless there. So they're not a big bird. They will catch hen pheasants. People fly them at cast, they will catch cock pheasants. It's ludicrous. You will not have a bird like these. They are just insane. I can't rate them enough. They're just... They're unlike anything else you're going to fly. But when you see them chase from a tiny little passerine, a little songbird, um, to magpies in the open, they won't want to crash into cover so much like a spa, but they'll take on magpies on long slips. But when you see them chase a hen pheasant, when you're weighing in at 13 and a half ounces, these birds are another level fulcrum bird that is just so untried and untested here in the UK. And now the prices come down, you're gonna see more and more of us wanting to fly them. Why did I hand Mayer over as a lure bird and didn't hunt her every season? Lack of game and running the Falconry Center 
utter lack of time. I can pick Zeus up. He's on a running line, a golden eagle. He keeps relatively fit on his own. He's, just, he's like a house. So I don't have to deal with him for two weeks if I don't want to, um, in a manning sense, and we'll just get on with it. We've got that bond. You can't fly any falcon once a week and expect it to be fit. You've got to fly them regularly. But no game things creep in what crept in to me i didn't have the game and the time so i was flying along lot to hold carcasses letting her feed up to try and keep that you're killing you're killing but at the end of the day she's still coming to me and that beautiful well-manned well-mannered uh, parent reared female turned into the worst mantling screaming imprint less sociable like a harris hawk get those birds hunting if you want the best mannered parent reared one get them hunting to keep this sane and get that independence. Um, another thing as a sideline, because I am going back and forth here, is flying them on a bull cross lure machine. But be careful. These birds are so fast off the mark and they turn so tightly sometimes that they'll go at a right angle <laughs> around the pulley, almost on the lure. Keep that lure ahead of them. They will get caught by the clip by the lure line. I know, I've done it. So different ways to keep them fit, but I'm gonna tell you, your biggest thing is get them hunting and catching and have a game under them every single day. Do what you would do if you're a really committed falconer. Go somewhere where there's game, have the game, have the land, get those birds out and hunting every single day. Male, female, that's up to you. The, I was looking at really partridge and magpie when I got my my girl to hunt with. So it was gonna be a female all the way through. If you've got lots of things like, especially um, starlings or something that sort of size, definitely the male's gonna be up for it. I'm sure he's gonna be up for magpies and they'll probably take things like pigeons. Uh, they'll probably chase pheasants knowing those guys. But for what I had, it was always gonna be the female. Match the bird to the land and the quarry you have available. Male and female, they're both utterly beautiful, beautiful birds to work with. Graham Forbes, uh, Forbes Falkery. Uh, currently, he's the only sort of friend I've got that's actually that I know of that's actually working with him. Uh, he he's he wanted imprint. Imprints are his thing as well. He's got an imprint female, and as many people have tell you, it's been up and down. And uh, people tell you this with pure jerk falcons, it's not all going to happen in the first season for everyone. The birds take a little bit to mature. They're sociable. They learn. He's now finally after putting in a whole season. We're now into spring putting in so much work with his bird bit of success no success at all bit of success really difficult he's now getting there he's got this bird on magpies he flies on big open land and he's getting there he's persevered and that's the key with Fulker isn't it that is the key when, you, when you've considered your land and your quarry the key is routine and perseverance if you like to have a bird fly it chop and change get on to the next one don't waste a life and your time with an aplomado. If you like a bird that's for life or for a few seasons, really get to know it. Maybe before you go use it for breeding or send it off for breeding or whatever. If you're a committed falconer to that bird and you like to keep that bird and see it progress and mature, then yes, an aplomado falcon could really be the thing for you because they do get better. Don't write it off if it all seems a bit useless. Persevere, make a few tweaks. Graham Forbes, he's having good success. He's got a beautiful Aplomado falcon. Um, he got an imprint. He really didn't want it to make a noise at home. It does, uh, and they will. They will, unless you're just very good at imprinting without sounds, uh, which for most of you is gonna make a noise, just like imprinting a Harris hawk. Thomas, with that amazing bird, Alan, his Harris's hawk, it's silent. But the work that went in behind that, most of us haven't even got the opportunity to, to rear a bird like that. So I think the bulk of, the bulk of the end, of, I'm looking at my thing here, I'm looking at the phone thinking how long this will took. <gasps> Goodness me, this is gonna struggle to upload. <laughs> I'm gonna, not, I'll, I'll come and see you at the end, but I'm gonna let the ending of this film, I'm gonna hand you over to Jose Suto, um, incredibly well-known chef and falconer, um, co-owner, bird of prey sort of outfit owner and falconry bird breeders. He and his wife, Charlotte, they breed various birds of prey. They work with aplomados. They know more people than I that they have sold their young to that have had success with aplomados. So I'm gonna let these guys, well, actually I'm gonna let Jose tell you some of his thoughts on the species. And you're gonna hear echoes of what I've already said. You're gonna hear some things that 
we've done differently or that I've said are okay that he's saying oh that will be a struggle with that we've got our own opinions of course but he certainly is an expert on Aplomados and he's got the benefit of hearing about the success of the birds he and Charlotte have bred so enjoy these clips um, be grateful you know people giving up their time to add to this video as I am enjoy and I'll see you guys in a few minutes Oh yeah, yeah, so we breed Aplomados here, um, and uh, what can I say about the breeding of them? Um, they have their eccentricities, I mean they're, they're <coughs> um, a little bit unusual in breeding. Uh, the fact that basically the, uh, the eggs take quite a long time to hatch, um, they can be very, very territorial within their aviaries, so basically they don't like being upset in their aviaries. Um, and that's one of the ways that you know that you've got a really good bonded pair if you walk past the aviaries and they all both sort of kick off and start screaming, you know, they don't even have to see you, they just hear you. Um, then you know that you've got a good bonded pair. <clears throat> uh, they're great parents um, looking after the chicks, um, although they can be quite aggressive with the chicks sometimes, um, especially when you're putting the chicks back, you've got to be quite careful. Um, flying them, they're a great bird. Um, they are so unusual in the way that they fly. They have sort of the, uh, the ability of a falcon um, and also something like a sparrowhawk or, or a goshawk. Um, they're fast, they're agile. Um, in actual fact, I mean, I, I've heard people sort of say that they're a, they have sort of like the mentality of a Harris hawk. They're quite biddable, and they have the sort of agility and speed of a, of a goshawk and, and a falcon. So there's sort of a mix between the three of them. Um, they don't like hooding. Um, absolutely, do not like hooding. Um, I do know people that have hooded them, um, and I had a friend of mine who had one of our ones, and he hooded it, and he did it quite well, and. And that bird was, was actually very, very happy being hooded. But as it got to about five or six years old, it, it sort of started to take umbrage with the hood. Although once he hooded it, it would be fine and it would, you know, fly absolutely fantastically after he unhooded it. It didn't take, it wasn't, it was angry at being hooded, but it did take umbrage to the point of being hooded. Um, so yeah, I mean, hooding, a lot of people don't bother hooding them. Um, you don't need to hood them. <clears throat> yeah, I've, we've flown them uh, waiting on. Um, and they fly fantastically well waiting on. Uh, we flown them up to the drones and trained them on the drones. Uh, we found that a little bit of drain, drone training with them is good because what you tend to find is when the birds basically fly after something, uh, they'll tend to come back and wait above you. Um, you're just waiting on, waiting for you to basically to reflush or to flush something new. Um, one of the best flights I ever had with one um, was basically here where we are, um, where I live, which is quite open ground. Um, and we had a covey of partridges basically get up in front of us and there was about sort of 10 birds in this covey and we were a good 30 yards behind them and as they got up this female just basically left off the fist she went straight after them uh, <clears throat> she put in a good 800 yards uh, sprint after them and took one out of the air and dropped it to the ground and actually when we got to her um, it was a hen bird that she had hold of and there was a cock bird that was basically trying to peck her and she was trying to grab hold of the cock bird as well um, speed wise I think she did 47 mile an hour and they're basically straight flight straight after them um, so they're really quite agile fast birds very tenacious as well the only thing is with them as well is people you need to have patience with them uh, Aplomados are not a bird that in their first year will kill everything that you basically put up they they sometimes take a little while to learn you know and, and that's very evident in basically when you're putting game up in front of them they need to learn the game they need to learn about basically how to fly them and then all of a sudden it would just click you know and, and you'll get that fantastic flight and after it's clicked then they're just murderous so they basically want everything that gets up in front of them heard guys you know we've sold them to guys that are basically thrown them at pigeons had great success at pigeons um, other guys basically have flown females at pheasants um, and uh, we've yet had to have anybody fly them at ducks um, but they're quite a small bird so if the duck was to drop, uh, drop them into water um, I think they'd have quite a, a hard job of basically holding them in the water our females basically fly at just under a pound, which are quite big in comparison to some of the Aplomados in the UK. And, and our males have quite a wide range. I mean, they go anything from about nine ounces up to about 10, 11 ounces, depending on what you've got. The big question with them is obviously parent reared or, or, or you know, imprints. Um, I've seen both fly well. Um, I've seen both breed. Um, I've seen, uh, I think the social imprints I've seen that have been, have been the best ones. Um, yeah, basically when for, for rearing. But I've seen parent reared ones that fly real well. Charlotte's flown. Uh, ones in demo um, and they've all been parent reared ones and they've flown really really well and they'll, they'll fly the lure really well 
um, some of the imprint ones basically don't necessarily fly the lure as well. So the other question is obviously uh, male or female. Um, most people basically that uh, look for us for an Appromata, they're wanting a female because uh, the female is larger. But you shouldn't discount a male. Uh, males, uh, although they're smaller, they're quite fast and like a male Harris Hawk, they're quite tenacious. Um, Finding a cast is really good when you've got a male and a female together. I mean, I've got a friend of mine who used to fly a male and a female cast, and uh, they took a rabbit together. Um, yeah, the, the the male, as the rabbit got up and ran across open ground, the male basically kept chopping the rabbit and chopping it and chopping it, and the female basically kept chopping it as well until they knocked it over and sort of just grabbed hold of it. And um, so they're, they're very, very tenacious. Males do really well with basically small game. So uh, I've got a friend of mine who in Ireland who's basically flying one at Snipe and Woodcock. Um, and uh, he's, he's had a, a varying amount of big success with them. He's had some phenomenal flights with them. Um, I've got another friend of ours who's basically flying it at pigeons, at, uh, wood pigeons, and that's males at wood pigeons. And he's had a lot of success with them. Um, so yeah, I mean they're, they're, they're sort of a, a varying thing. I mean, I wouldn't. It's it's sort of not like a sparrowhawk. I mean these these birds are slightly bigger than a sparrowhawk. So you can't think of a male aplomado would only take what a male spa would take it can take larger game than a male spa a male aplo would basically be able to take something like a partridge um, and it would overhaul and pull, bring down a partridge easily um, and sort of anything basically up to about the size of a partridge females basically anything up to the size of a person so there's, there's sort of horses for courses out of both of them but don't discount the males the males are basically quite good you know and if you can fly a cast together um, in America you'll see a lot of guys basically flying them off tea perches uh, where they'll fly a cast together and the birds will return to the tea perch and take take on flight after flight after flight returning to the tea perch so yeah I mean they're, the males are as good as the females um, when it comes to basically aggressiveness and, hum, and ability to hunt um, they're just obviously the size basically impicts them a little bit but you know males are good for basically most feathered game Females basically that go that little bit further when you're something like a, a, a hen or a cock pheasant. I mean, one, we've got one female here that flew a pound, and uh, she regularly used to take cock pheasants and and a red legged partridge and also grey partridges. So yeah, they're, they're they're both as good as each other. Well, you guys, I hope you enjoyed that. I hope you do appreciate um, Jose there and Charlotte putting in some time for our benefit uh, about these magnificent birds. Read Bob's book, read my magazine article. They will both enthuse you. If an upload Mardo falcon is something you want, it's something you have the land and time for, and you can save up that piggy bank. Yeah, put it, as I've said in the magazine article, put one on your bucket list of falconry. They are unlike any other falconry bird, excuse me, <coughs> except maybe a New Zealand falcon in the things that they do and how they go about it and their tameness. They're almost like having a pet falconry bird. That'll get me some bad press, but they're that good. Enjoy them. Hope this has been okay. I hope I managed to overlay enough of my ugly mug with some beautiful photos of my birds and Graham's birds and other birds. Please subscribe. This channel's hovering at the moment. Goodness me, help me give it a push and get it back going. Get that momentum back to the channel. Subscriber count's going up, but the rest is on a bit of a plateau lately. I'm gonna put the content in. I've listened to what you've said. You'll get some videos like this longer one, interspersed with some more five minute videos with some helpful tops, top tips and facts shortened down. Please help me out. See you in the next one.